everybody. What's up? My name is Indy, and the man sitting next to me is Jay from the Powell Group Consulting. And welcome to Indie Game Business. First off, we, of course, want to thank Tripwire Presents for being an amazing sponsor. I just got back from TwitchCon, and that's some super exciting news. And I would like to introduce Marcella. And the topic today, is there a magic formula for marketing your game? Bum, bum, bum. So, Dan, did you jump in the phone pit at Twitch? I did. You did? Did, did you break your No, button? actually, I did not. I did not. It was it was a very shallow phone pit. It uh, sounds like a lawsuit ready to happen. So, Marcella, <laughs> welcome to the show. We had Ivan on last week, so it's like we're doing back-to-back -back joystick venture, which is all cool because y'all are, are good. Um but so we met over at Gamescom and Marcella is one of those people that she's like, oh, I live there. And oh, yeah, I live there. And it's like, <laughs> what, it's like we can do a whole show just talking about her life up to this point. But <laughs> let's start with how you got into the industry and walk us through what you've been doing so far. It, I love those like really broad questions. Uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of like... Uh, where did you start? But I guess, how do I end up in the industry? It's it's through Joystick Ventures, I suppose. Um, I've known Ivan, who's a managing partner for many years from working in the startup sector. So that sort of connects with the other part of the question. And um, I don't know, I've, I've really respected him and I've, I've always respected him and his vision and what he wanted to do. So when he told me about the fund and all the goals that they had, it just made sense. And I remember when we were at Gamescom, we were talking a little bit about this, but from my previous experiences, I've been working in the fintech sector, ed tech sector, basically startups and being the head of growth. So user acquisition, user retention being like the main things that I've been focusing on. I ended up being really burned out. And I think one of the things that was like really tiring me and making me look for something else was the fact that there's very little spaces in life in which in my day-to-day -day that I had in which I was like just focusing on doing things because they're fun you know just because I like to do them and I think 2020 was a very big call to change that because all of a sudden you're locked inside your house and all I had was work and that was quite miserable. So I was like, uh-uh, I need to change my life. And then Ivan comes over and talks to me about this fun and investing in indie games. And it just sort of made sense to me. Like, I want to do things that are fun. And I want to focus my life, my energy, my resources to cultivating that, you know, which is doing things just because, you know, you enjoy them out of pure joy because they they connect you because you feel something, right? So that's that's more or less why I ended up here. So is is the gaming industry fun then? <laughs> what a tricky question. Um, it, it, I mean, it really is. It's It can be very, really tiring um, in the sense that there's lots of different things to do. And as you know, there's lots of different time zones to be working on and you don't even know which day it is some days. Um, nonetheless, I think the core of the reason of why this industry exists, I think it's still very much fun. I always love to, I mean, because I've, I've spent my entire career in this industry. I don't know anything else. It's like, don't put me, I'm good at this. Don't ask me to do something different because that's going to go really badly. But mm -hmm. I always love to get the perspective of people who have worked in other industries for a while and then they come into games and it's like, so what's different, what's new, what's good, what's bad? What do you feel has been the biggest adjustment moving to our industry from others? Um, <laughs> I think there's loads. I think the first one is language. You know, every industry, every sector has always like, I, I call it like a barrier of entry, which is wording, slang, um language that people use to refer to certain things that you don't understand if you're not part of that industry so yeah even like marketing terms it things like that you're like ah 
is that what they're supposed to mean? So you're like constantly translating. I had done that before. I worked in fintechs as like financial and technology sector. And I also didn't study anything with finance related or anything like that. So I it also took me a while to learn the, the lingo, but I think the video game industry has loads more. It's like an entire world on its own. <laughs> That's pretty intense. No, it is. It's like, I tell people when they come in, I'll like, take everything that you know from whatever you used to do and just throw that right out the window because it's completely non-applicable now. And <laughs> then we're going to go with something different. So yeah. it, tell us what, let's talk about first what you do on the marketing and branding side at Joystick. And then we can get into questions and other parts in terms of, you know, games and development studios and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so basically CMO is kind of like a weird, funny title for an investment fund. But, you know, like you just said, you have to throw everything out of a window. Everything you know, it doesn't work and it changes here. It's true. It's 100% true. Um, so basically my position sort of has been morphing and changing depending on what is really needed. But I think the key thing with Joystick Ventures is as an investment fund, we really mean it when we say, how can I be of help? I know this is kind of like a meme in the startup industry. It's like, VCs coming and telling you like how can I be of help and they're not doing anything we actually do stuff and to the point that my position is more related to the portfolio and not necessarily to like finding games which you know if there's pitches and stuff I'll still get them and that's so much fun um but I work directly with portfolio and that means so many different things so once we sign a game it basically becomes Marcella's problem in the fund and <laughs> I, I need that. I'm just <laughs> you need someone like me. <laughs> yes. We have signed a client. Now it's Marcella's problem. <laughs> <laughs> that is more or less what I do at Joystick. But as it turns out with you know the industry, it, it is very much related to how are you going to position a game? How are you going to market it? What are the goals to, for the game and how we're going to achieve those? And that also translates to sales. So yes, loads of studios have loads of capabilities with, you know, creating these imaginary worlds that there exist only in their heads and then bring them then to life for us. But, you know, sometimes they have trouble explaining that oh. precisely in a story format and then packaging it, let's say, and presented it in a marketing campaign. So that's what I've been doing a lot. And, and this is an excellent segue for me to remind everybody that the next picture game, watch my ADD in action, Marcella. Um, the next <laughs> picture game is actually coming up in a little over a, uh, a week. No, 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 no. You got a month. But that, I mean, so the reason I segue into that completely non sequitur you know, thing because that is, you know, a whole thing on Twitter that Liam and, and Indie Game Lover run where your objective as the developer is to pitch your game in one tweet. And that it, it's extremely valuable because it makes you really think about that stuff because you're right. It's like we see so many developers who go out and they build this wonderful world and fantastic game. But you ask us, like, so what's it about? And you get like a six minute dialogue and it's like no, no 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 you gotta boil that shit down i asked johan over at raw fury the other day i was like what is dome keeper about and he goes it's basically missile command meets um dig dug i think is what he said and i was like <laughs> okay i get it i i understand exactly what that is so when you're on the market, when things become your problem, mm -hmm. are you pitching and marketing to publishers as a B2B side or are you marketing to consumers? I mostly do B2C, um, so directly consumers. Um, we have done co-investments with our publishers and we're always open to do that. It's just finding the right sort of business terms and things. It's always tricky. But I've been doing mostly uh, direct to consumers, which is really interesting for me, to be honest. 
<laughs> so one of the things that we wanted to touch on today was, and this is interesting because I don't even know the answer to this question. You say that branding and marketing and sales are not the same thing. And I get branding and marketing are not the same as sales. I don't know the difference between branding and marketing though. So let's just start there. Okay. What is branding and then what is marketing? <laughs> it's like I'm going back to school. But that's um, it. That's why we do this show. Yeah, so no, yes. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm joking because I am actually an anthropologist, so I didn't study any of this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this this is coming from lessons let's say on the field of just selling stuff for different sectors um so branding is more or less the your brand you know you you've got nike which is a really big famous brand like you know you come to bring a personality and even like a story in itself of the brand which could be your game or it could be the studio or it could be your business. You know, it's all different things, but they, they must have a brand. And then, and that has to be unified in a sense that the colors, the imagery, even the, the strokes that you end up using in terms of graphic design if, if, um, are so easy to be identifiable across different spaces that when you do a marketing campaign, which is, you know, the actual execution of different things, you can still recognize which brand is telling you what story. So first you have to have a brand that it's unified and has its own vision, perspective, personality on its own that exists like that. And then you can build as many marketing campaigns that you need, depending on the goals that you have related to your sales goals. So it's marketing is more the execution of different um, goals, or let's say um, business goals for the brand. So the brand is who you are and the marketing is how you tell people who you are. Yes. So, oh, you're, you're so good. <laughs> well, that, that's not from a business or marketing degree. That's from an English literature degree where I, you know, you learn how to bullshit anything. So that's the, um, <laughs> that, that, that's the trick there. Um, it's bang off. So explain why you would need multiple marketing campaigns around and we'll go from the game side not necessarily the studio side but if you've yeah. got one game you've got your game and you're selling it to consumers why do you need multiple marketing campaigns to go do that i mean people can always do whatever they want with their game. <laughs> my recommendation would be to have multiple marketing campaigns so let's just do an example we're sitting at the 14th of october today and you know what's happening at the end of this month retail wise there is an interesting holiday that is called halloween in the u.s uh day of the dead in mexico so there's like a theme and people are already looking for theme this theme interesting related topics or things to consume for so you can build a marketing campaign for halloween and you can also build a marketing campaign for christmas you can also build a marketing campaign for your summer sale or you can also build a marketing campaign for your demo or for your pitch or for any goal that you have, basically. You just made me realize that I'm going to miss Day of the Dead in Mexico for like two days. That's the <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of sad. <laughs> but you could also do, you know, like Walmart here in the U.S. does and start your Christmas campaign like at the 1st of October. And, you know, it, it all mixes up. But I mean, that that's the point. You've got to, you've got to be able to tailor that message to what's current you know, whether it is in, you know, a holiday or a sale or even like pop culture and, and things like that. It's like, I still remember when the Titanic movie came out, there was this, what was it? I think it was in like Macromedia Flash game. I mean, very basic not about the Titanic, nothing to do with the movie, but that game ended up selling a bajillion copies because they, they the tailored name. the marketing around, hey, look, you saw this movie, now go explore the Titanic. So um, how do you, okay, so the second half of that original question. So how do you incorporate effectively the branding and the marketing side of it into the sales aspect? So I, I always like to think about what is it that we want to achieve first before thinking about anything else so in terms of like it's kind of like i don't know going on a hike and you're like i want to get to this point and then you 
decide how many snaps you want to bring or if you need a bottle of water or anything like that and then you go obviously you can go rogue and do a hike on your own but you might end up you know finding a bear or breaking something and you know so i think it's my my attempt to try to do a simple analogy is just going too far um <laughs> Now I need a video game about doing rogue hikes. <laughs> rogue hikes, right? Here we go. See, I'm just creating new games already. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, oh God, I lost track. So we were talking about... Talking about how did you uh, get Incorporated. Your... Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I think if, if you have a really clear goal of your sales objectives, then it's easier to just connect those to how many different things and activities you need to have, which it can be marketing campaigns to achieve those goals. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that, you know, it's very strict and it's not modifiable. So it's something that can be always changing and be organic. But you can either think of it in, from if, you know, if you're a developer or a studio and you invested, I don't know, a certain amount of money already on a game on your own. So maybe just recouping that could be your first goal in creating like, okay, I need to create this amount of money and then you translate it into units uh, in a certain pricing. And then you say, okay, I need to sell this amount of units. So then you start creating the, the plan. So I try to, to do things backwards as opposed to like forwards and then wishful thinking happens afterwards because um, you might not end up selling anything if you do that. So, you know, it's just, it's my way of working, I guess, in that sense that doing it backwards, I think like, okay, I've got these goals and I have to try all these different things to achieve those. And I like to have an, a like scientific approach to this in the sense that everything is a trial. You know, scientists are always like testing and trying things. And then if they break something, they're like, whoops, we shouldn't do that. Um, I think that's the best approach to do it. You know, you're like, okay, here's my goal. Maybe if I do a marketing campaign for... Halloween, even though my game's, you know, not about Halloween, but we can do a character or, or something and it doesn't work, then you're like, okay, broke that, shouldn't do it, trying something else. It's, it's especially true in this industry when consumers have such a short attention span and memory in the first place. It's like we used to see, you know, big double A, triple A games, they would start marketing, you know, 18 months in advance. And now it's not uncommon for games not to be heavily marketed until like three months before they launch because otherwise people just get, you know, they're, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, whatever. It's like, I'm already, I'm very excited about, you know, the new Bethesda game, but I'm already sick of hearing about it in the press. It's like, just launch the damn game. Let's, let's be done with this. All right. So our I, I, first... an interesting thing about that is like, I would say if you're an indie studio, I wouldn't, think that the same rules apply of like those three months they don't before, because nobody knows you and like holding off secrets to the press like the press doesn't even know who you are the journalists are flooded with so many different games and questions it's like no you do the opposite not three months you build the community and you start building it from scratch you know it's, just, it's a different thing so, yeah, because you got to have the community one way or another. So, um, all right, our first question comes in from Blast. Where are you running these marketing campaigns? Everywhere and anywhere you can, I guess. That makes sense for, for a game. I think one of the important things is to sort of have a strategy on like, okay, we want to achieve this. Um, and you can create a marketing campaign through mailing and create a newsletter, which, you know, Jay, you know that about that, and it's yours is pretty cool. Um, you Aww. can also I, I read it. I, I get informed through it. <laughs> um, you can you can also run marketing campaigns on social media. You can um, run them on just one social media platform. It could be TikTok, could be just Facebook. I don't know. It depends on your audience what you want to achieve, and it connects to your strategy. You can also do old school publicity, which, you know, banners and printing and flyers in which spaces where you want to do it. Um, yeah. So anywhere and everywhere you can, basically, um, it, uh, as a marketer, people will always be like, yeah, anywhere you can. All right. We're going to do this question and then remind me, we're going to come back to marketing persona so you can figure out where these need to go. How risky is it to brand to a brand to experiment and try different marketing tactics and how hesitant should we be in marketing our indie game in very different ways? 
Oh, I love this. Yeah, I, I, I think um, trying and testing, uh, being trying to be as bold as you want and as bold as you can, it's always going to pay back because you will find out faster what's not working. What I would say is like, if you've got experiments, I would try to make them as minimum viable products as possible. So you're like, oh, we want to see if our game would be a good fit for this market or this audience or this country. Try to find a way to test that assumption in the cheapest possible way. And by that, I mean like, you can even create a fake account, you can, I, there's so many different solutions to testing that you don't need a big budget. You don't need to have people on board already with your idea. You just have to be able to willing to try it and have more or less of a goal. But yeah, if you're a new brand and you're trying to figure out who are your people, play with it as much as you can, test as many assumptions as you can. And you don't need a lot of money to do that. You just need to be really creative. Um, we said so Jawad when she says not a lot of money she really I mean we did the initial testing several years ago on marketing for indie game business on different socials with like a fifty dollar campaign and I mean because you can you can get that much data that quickly and it's like okay are people clicking through is this tweet monetize not monetizing but converting or all this other stuff literally fifty bucks. And if it doesn't work and you can see pretty early that it's not working, you kill it. Maybe you only spend seven. You know, if it's got 3,000 impressions and you've had no conversion, you don't need to spend the other $42 and a half dollars. Um, so, yeah, it can be really quick. Um, I mean, really cheap. So when we're talking about defining, you know, should you be on TikTok? Should you be on Facebook? Should you be on Twitter? Or should you be wherever? Talk a little bit about the marketing personas, how you build that and what their use is. Yeah, that's, I, I love that. Cause I, I end up talking to a lot of studios about things like this. And sometimes there is this assumption that your Twitter or your um, Instagram or whatever it is that you choose to start communicating about your game to is, um, I like an unofficial, non-movable channel or thing. You know, it's like, no, we always post this there and this is what people are used to. There is some truth to that, but you have to be having 20 millions of followers to think like that and like have a very established brand to already have like a lot of rules and guidelines about what you can do. I, I, I don't know if you know about um, this marketing joke, but it's a... Paddington, you know, Paddington the bear. Um, whenever they're, they're onboarding people for their Twitter, there's a couple of like very simple rules, like Paddington does not swear. Uh, Paddington always likes marmalade, <laughs> things like that. So um, unless you're like Paddington the bear tweeting officially, um, and even Paddington the bear still gets out of the rules now and then. So I think all these things are very flexible and way more flexible than they appear to be. Um, in, in the sense that you can always use them and adjust them to what is it that you want to communicate. Um, I'll give you a simple example. Previously, I was when I was working with a financial product, uh, we had um, Twitter as one of the official channels to communicate news or changes on the platform. And there was a lot of reluctance to change that Twitter account to anything else. And then I took over and I was like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so we started using that Twitter account also to connect to other people that were on Twitter that could benefit from this financial product. But we had to use a different language because the people using Twitter that are interested in finance are already more knowledgeable than uh, about what they're looking for. So we were like, okay, let's try and test this type of messaging. And it just started working. And then we were like, how about if we start expanding to a more mainstream audience? So like, to people that are not very specialized in finance, but they're they're interested in their optimizing their incomes. So we started moving slowly but steadily towards that end. And now it's a very um it now it's a channel for user acquisition instead of like user retention, which is informing your users about what's going on. So yes, this all of these um channels, I call them channels, uh, of distribution of your messages or your campaigns. Um 
can have a, a purpose and that purpose can be changed throughout time. And, and it's okay because things change and products change all the time. And that's, I, I guess, the core essence of innovating something. Nice. So Calix had a, uh, had a question. So in terms of like testing, what if you're just like posting mock-ups of non-existent games? What, how, how much, I mean, and I, not, I just commented, it's like, I know publishers that actually do that. You know? Oh, yeah. that's not a bad idea. I mean, I, I guess, I guess this is a good way of testing assumptions that, and that's a little bit what I was talking about before. It's like, you have an assumption like, oh, people really like um, octopuses. So I'm going to create a game about an octopus. And, uh, but it's an assumption, you know, you don't really know if people really like octopuses until you find out. So you can do a mock-up and try it out and start talking about it and see if people react positively to it. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think there's this fine line between marketing and being, you know, being true and honest. I, I, I always prefer the honesty route. Um, and I think it's always the best way to approach that. Um, in the sense that if you're not charging money or not, you know, taking something out of people, you can test your assumptions in a, in a, in a, in a good way. You know, as long as you're not hurting anyone or charging money for something that does not exist, you should be okay. So a good example here would be running a campaign, Facebook, Twitter, whatever campaign to point people to your wish list on Steam but actually testing out different pieces of key art to see which ones, you know, generate the most traffic. And, and then you can say, okay, well, this is the one that we should use for, you know, our actual Steam page or, or whatever. But yeah, those are the types of things that you can do. You play around with it and see what works and what doesn't work and go on from there. Yeah. Um, all right. Hold on. Next. Wait. Okay. All right. See, this is like last week. Y'all are going to do my job <laughs> for me. Uh, in the design stage of the game, should you market the idea and design or market the studio and what each member has done, is working on, or vague hints to the design of the game coming up? Oh, that's a brilliant question. I kind of like it. I, I often find lots of studios with this debate. Um, it, I, it all comes down to like simple questions. Is the studio story something interesting like people want to know about and maybe it's not or maybe the like people in the studio don't really want to be talking about themselves or how they got to a certain stage so then don't push it um and in terms of the game design you can also always be giving a little bit of updates and i i find a lot of studios very reluctant to sharing things that are not fully polished or finished and i am a little bit opposed to that because I think there is there is some and speaking about being truthful in your campaigns, there is a lot of like goodness that can come out of just sharing draw like drafts and like raw work and how much you've been progressing and like where do you want to go and sharing ideas that it, people are going to connect really well to that because I don't think people are really into looking at perfect images all the time. I don't know if if you spend any time on TikTok as much as I do, but TikTok's videos are not as polished as you would see them on Instagram. And people are so drawn to this more raw, um, easier, uh, more organic, more natural sort of content on TikTok because it just connects, you know? It, it, what you end up doing with these campaigns and all of this is connecting with people with something they care about or they're interested in. Um, so if it's if it's your game design, then try to find a, to a way to connect through that, which can be like, oh, these are my initial ideas, or how it started, how it's going, and you can keep doing that for for months, and people will always be amazed with the progress because we as humans are also you know connected to these things of like we want to progress, we want to improve ourselves, and like seeing improvements and other things can be really inspiring and really moving. Um, and if it's the studio stories, then yeah, also find a way to connect that to to other people, and that should be interesting enough. Humanize it. Yes. So we talked 
you know, very briefly about, you know, running the, the $50 Twitter campaigns and that sort of stuff. Jack Coder asked, can you tell me some other low budget marketing strategies? Because I mean, that's what we see with a lot of developers. It's like the main bottleneck is time because they don't have a dedicated marketing person and money, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and honestly, that'll make sense. Like, I, I think I didn't talk a lot about that when we started, but I built a startup. So this is why I ended up in the startup world because I actually built a company in my living room, like an actual, you know, one of those like Silicon Valley stories, um, but not really because I'm not there. Um, but yeah, I started a company and I, I really empathize and I really connect with that of like not having any time and not having any money. Nonetheless, I still build a business. And just to give you an example, that it was, it was a... It was an educational program for immigrants in Mexico so they could learn how to code. And I had no money to market and I needed students to like the program. And I just sort of mapped out what a day-to-day migrant does in Mexico and where they go. And I ended up going to call centers because that's where they end up working after they come back from the U.S. and they are fully bilingual and it's, you know. Um, So I just started doing like flyers that I would, print in someone else's office in black and white really bad design and I just like hand it out and like it was in Spanglish so using two languages that people connected with they just started following us on our Facebook account and then from there they started telling their friends and then we ended up having a really successful program and I spend I guess the equivalent of 10 US dollars on that campaign and that's how we started the um the first student batch and it was literally um yeah, me handing out flyers black and white in someone else's office printer that <laughs> it was paid by someone big, you know, big corporation. So yeah, it was kind, kind of they, lean. They have plenty of, you know, copy paper toner. They don't, they're not going to miss, you know. They didn't even notice. Work. The, and, and that is something that can also pretty easily be done on social media. You just, you've got to set expectations. You're not going to have something explode overnight it's going to be over time. I'm still shocked at how many people follow us and and sub to us. And and I'm like, but that's been four years of us doing this. And it, it, it just, it does take time, but you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You were probably really consistent and that's how no surprise you ended up where you are. Yeah, we'll go with that. That's what that, I also you know, <laughs> think it's because no one else does it. You know, that's the. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about wish lists because mm, we, my favorite one topic. of the most frequent questions that we get is how many wish lists do I need? And we're all like, <laughs> enough to sell the game. That's, you know, there's not like a magic number. But, mm. you know, Chris Zukowski was on for the conference the other week and he was talking about how wish list numbers aren't nearly as valuable as they used to be or indicative of success or failure as they used to be. Is when you're running these marketing campaigns is pushing people to that wish list effective or should you be pushing them somewhere else? Oh my God. This is my favorite topic as of recently. And I love that. He said that I, I love his videos and I, I, I agree a lot with whatever he has to say. Um, so let's, let's do like a little bit of a rundown rundown from a business perspective when it comes to wish lists. And I'll take you away from Steam for a minute. Um, So imagine that I work in Amazon or a retailer and I have to sell things. You know, I just have to position products. And imagine I spend all this money on a Halloween campaign to sell these pumpkins that we're going to put on Amazon. And I do all this like cool art and wonderful things. And I get people talk about it and everyone's super excited. But whenever I ask people to do something, when they're like, oh, my God, I love these pumpkins, I ask them to put it on their shopping cart for their goodwill wishes instead of, like, buy it now. There's a little bit of a disconnection there, right? So Mm -hmm. what ends up happening is you're asking for 
wishful thinking in a way. It's like, oh, maybe I'll buy that pumpkin. Thank you for telling me all about those wonderful pumpkins. Maybe one day. And then you leave it there and then it's Christmas. You completely forgot about the pumpkin. And now it's like, oh, a brand new toy. I'm going to buy that. So off you go. The pumpkin stays there. And then in order for you to hopefully sell your little pumpkin, you, if it's been sitting in someone's basket, you will have to discount that pumpkin so much so that that person in January, after all the Christmas holidays and shopping sprees, they're like, mm, what should I get? Oh, yes, this pumpkin's 90% off. I should get it. And then if you think about it from a business perspective, then you spend money marketing, cool, doing cool designs, um, getting some influencers on board, all of that to get someone to put it on their shopping cart. But then you also had to spend money out of your retail price to discount it. So you're, it's the most expensive marketing tactic in the world aim for wish lists it's it's super expensive i don't i don't even think amazon would dare to do that and they've got all the money they can afford i had never actually thought of it that way but you said you were going to take us away from steam and then you exactly described my steam wish list yeah the, but i hadn't that's fascinating because honestly i had never thought about it like that and you're right it's, it's like if you're spending in your mind it's like okay i'm spending 50 cents to market a game that's going to sell for $50. Well, yeah. that's a no brainer. You know, that, that makes perfect sense. But then when yeah. you start thinking about that gets expensive over time and now you're not selling it for $50, you're selling it for $5. Mm. That's not nearly as effective. So if you're not pushing people to a wish list, then where should you be pushing people? Ooh. Interesting. So I love all those different possibilities. And I think I, I, it's not that I'm completely like, oh, I don't do wish lists. I just think you have to be very real with what a wish list means. And you have to monetize it or quantify it as if you were quantifying likes, because that's what it actually means. It's someone liking your game. And because it's easy to do, you just click and then you have nothing else to do in regards to the game. So you, it's, it is an expression of people's interest and the likability of your game and engagement. And there's, that, that's a lot of information that you can be, that can be useful. And there's different things you can do with that. It's either you start realizing there's a market and you can start commercializing your game in a different way. There's cool tools like early access, even if your game's not fully polished and you start adding more content. And there's so many different things you can do. Um, we are starting to do some pre-orders for some of our games. And pre-orders are also a cool thing because like you can reward the community that is there early and like give them some cool perks for being there with you. And you're also you're already not sort of devaluating all the work and hard work you've done in marketing sense. You're already commercializing it. And then you reward people for being there early. So it just it's a good trade-off, you know. Um when it comes to wish lists, if you are aiming for wish lists, then you always have to consider that that is information about the game. It's not necessarily a selling point. So if you have, if you don't have a sales goal, uh, then it will be really hard for you to think about how many wish lists do you need. So yes, people always ask me like, oh, then how many wish lists should a game get? And I am like, I have no idea. Uh, I mean, if you want to quantify them in, uh, in terms of um, wish list, then you're probably going to need, I mean, right now the conversion rates on wish list, I, I think I, I read about it last week, it's around 12% in, in, in the best case scenario. So if, if you have a goal, then you're working with wish list, then you think about that 12% and that 12% of your wish list, then that's your actual commercialization of your game. That's bad. And and the thing is, the further you are, you are that the further out you are from launch, the worse it's gonna be because then people are going to like literally completely forget about and I've had whenever I get that email from Steam that's like 48 games on your wish list are on, on sale. And I'm like, I don't even remember why this was on my wish list at this point, but let me go back and, and take another 
look at it and go from there. But yeah. I love I love that you said that because like remember when I was talking about you have to heavily discount your game in order for to convert people. You're also competing on an email list with other games that are yes. on discount. So it's yes. super hard. It's super hard to convert. I'm I'm still I'm still looking for that data. But yeah, it says I mean I just found an article from like May of this year. It says the average overall conversion rate for a wish list to sell on Steam is about 10 to 20%. Um <clears> and then yeah, yeah, that's gonna highly fluctuate from from game to game. Uh uh let's see questions. Do you have any advice for how to reach iOS users in a post iOS 14.5 <laughs> world? We have a product that's a self-care per virtual pet that sold very well on iOS. We haven't found a way back in since. Do Apple search ads work? Can you figure it out yourself or do you need a professional? <laughs> I love these like really specific questions because it's like you're getting a free consultancy. <laughs> I'm joking. Actually, I, I, that sounds like a cool product to be honest. It's Tamagotchi meets Headspace. I love Headspace. It's one of my favorite digital products. So that's a pretty cool reference. Um, I know, here's the thing. I don't know a lot about what's going on with uh, the, the Apple store. What we know is that Apple announces the last announcement that they're going to spend how much money on marketing this year. It's like they've never spent this much money before. So it's... Um, it's an indication of where the company is heading to and what they're trying to achieve. And I know that, you know, from what they've been talking about, they're exploring their marketing side of business. So it wouldn't be a surprise that they start having their own new rules in the store. And because of that, right now, the algorithms are not working as before. So oof, complicated. I would say test and experiment yourself in this transition moment because you know, just the context of that specific company. I wouldn't pay for a professional right now because there's so many things changing with the store and the algorithm at this time. So it would be kind of hard to find someone that, or unless they work for the company, that they can give you more solid and sound advice. But I would experiment and keep trying different things, different messages. Remember that, you know, it works searching, you know, words people are looking for, I don't know, self-care and things like that. So try to play with synonyms or a cool copywriting in the description of your product, things like that should be able to help. The other thing to keep in mind is that yeah. everyone in the U S and Western yeah. Europe in particular has a bias towards Apple because we see so much of it and it's marketed and hyped as the hip product. It's actually worldwide, the second biggest platform. If you want to reach more people, you go to the Android side Android. of the world. So always keep that in mind. You know, we have a bias here on yes, yeah, our, that, side, that, our side of the planet. <laughs> that That is actually very true. You have to remember that there is, you know, even I'm sitting in Mexico, like this, Latin America, there is this region of the world has a lot of connection through mobiles, but they're definitely more um, present with the Android um, source. So, yeah. All right. Well, while Dan bans our Tinder hot singles ads that just kind of pop through chat, always makes me feel good. You know, the, the, when we get spammed, it means we're important, I guess. Uh, so, question from R Light Games Do you guys at Joystick fund open world action RPGs? And Jay, did the Powell Group help indies as well? If so, how do you guys feel about the genre? I'll answer real quick. Yes, of course we help indies. I love helping indies. I've been doing it for 25 years. But I am not one of those that gives a preference on genre. If the game is fun, I don't care what it is. I mean, if you look at my what I play on a weekly basis, and it tons of variation in there. But what, what about you, Marcella? Do you all fund them? What, what's, the, what's the take on the genre? Um, same like you. I don't have any preferences in genre, and nor does the fund. So we do fund a lot of different types of projects and on different types of stages. Um, unfortunately, on the website, if you go to the website, you're not going to be able to see our entire portfolio because you know how this industry works. There are some things that haven't been announced yet, but we're working on some really cool, 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 cool games. I'm so excited about next year. Um, but that means that we fund anything to everything. And unfortunately, right now, I can't show you the vast difference with our portfolio, but it's really, really different. Um, as long as the game's good, <laughs> that's basically the number one rule. So if 
you know, uh, they've got a pitch, they should send her over to Joystick. Um, obviously, if they do find me, because some developers have found me and they're very clever in that way, because if they send it through the the, the fund in itself, it, it's going to get through its investment process and it can be lengthy. So when they find me, they're like, oh, push it in the front. And if I like it, I do push it to the front. Um to the front of the line it's not cheating it's just being clever and i reward people that are clever it's your job that's the thing yeah. it's like your job is to find the good stuff and so yes if there's good I mean, we all do that that's why i always tell people if, if, if a publisher right. or an investment group has a place on their website like you all do to submit stuff do that and then ping the person that you know at the company and say can you push, push that this a little bit yeah so yeah is it a good use of your budget to run YouTube ads to bring people to your Kickstarter for a game that's six months away from release, assuming that YouTube ads are good for that game? Or is it better to save that portion of the budget and add to the budget for YouTube ads at release? I am so worried about answering this because I don't want to give advice. And like, I don't want people to do what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just lost my ass because Marcella told me to put a hundred thousand dollars in YouTube ads. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, she was like, "Just go for it." I mean, here's the interesting. I would say let's break this down. So you're doing YouTube ads, which is a paid marketing effort, which has a price, and it would be good to research the click to rate costs on the regions that you're running it first to see how much money you you will be willing and trying to spend but then you have a, a specific call to action which is like you're asking people to do something specifically afterwards um so you're sending them to kids kickstarter um so that is a way to commercialize it and you are um let's say doing a more efficient call to action than a wishful like maybe this will happen this is something that people can click on and purchase something on however there there is the other thing that um if you can use this more efficient this budget more efficiently once you launch the game and like you can send people to immediately start buying your game then that's also good there is no good or bad basically um it's just a matter of what you want to achieve and what your whole strategy of the game is and, and dan just told me that we have like five more questions queued up so this is going <laughs> we, we might go a little long if that's okay with you we're going on a rogue hike yes rogue hikes <laughs> after i put all my marketing budget into youtube ads for my kickstarter campaign does Marcella prefer milk or sugar with that latte <laughs> i i i everyone at joystick especially van always laughs at, at me when i order coffee because I order decafs and I know, I know, I saw your face. Everyone does the same face and with oat milk. So he's like, you're basically not drinking anything that is real. This is, see, this is like one of my rants. There's no <laughs> such thing as oat milk. There's no such thing as almond milk. <laughs> Those are juices. Stop calling them milk. And my son is 11 and he knows that gets on my nerves. And so he brings it up like at any point in time. <laughs> There's no such thing as oat milk. There's <laughs> goat oh, milk. It. Yes. Oat milk. No, you're drinking oat juice in your decaf coffee, which is I don't with even my know fake what... coffee. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God, so... Marcella. That's not... all right. Um, <laughs> Since game industry professionals talk with each other and share projects a lot, would it be a good idea to market not only to consumers, but also to market the technical and art side to game industry professionals? Yeah. I mean, again, what do you want to achieve with that? Do you want other industry professionals to see it and share it to someone to give you funding? Like, are you looking for funding or are you looking for someone else to promote it? Or do you want like what is it you want to achieve with that basically um if you if you have that clarity then yes it makes sense i mean why not the trouble is and i always say that when you're talking to different audiences you have to be careful on how you do it and where you do it uh because sometimes it's tricky i mean it's sometimes you might end up not talking to anyone because you're like oh i'm talking to my direct consumers but also uh, the people that could potentially fund the game and it just sounds weird or your messaging and like nobody gets it 
so you completely miss both potential markets so yeah that could be one of the bad consequences of doing that but i wouldn't say why not i would say why not as long as like you have clarity on what you want to achieve and keep in mind that most of the technical people in the industry that you're going to market to are also consumers <laughs> And, we get we buy games, but yeah, and, and it's like if you you got to be careful how much you you spend because different there there's different market sizes. Obviously, there's a shitload more consumers to market to than there are technical people in the industry. So you just have to be careful about. I mean, and, yeah, it's, it's and not the, bad. I I I love how you said that we're also consumers and we also play games. And from a marketing perspective, if I see a studio doing something really really clever with their social media they will catch my attention immediately. Like they don't need to do anything else but doing it, doing something right for their communities and audiences to catch my attention. So, I don't know. We're, we're, we're not in this industry to make money because God knows we can all do that somewhere I, else a hell of a lot I, easier. I was in the financial industry, I know that. You took a hell of a pay cut, didn't you, Marcel? <laughs> I did. But hey, I, at least like I wake up in the morning and like, Yesterday, I was like reviewing some pictures that I got and I was like, oh my God, I love that my morning is about whether this puppy game should get funding or this like roguelike that is punching this crazy boss. How, what are we going to do about the, you know, it's, I wish I could go into details about what I was looking at, but I was like, I love this job. I really love it. What if we just put together a puppy roguelike, you know, where you're, <laughs> With a you're big boss. going on rogue hikes and then <laughs> we win the internet. <sighs> we win the internet. And like at the end, there's a big, you know, boss that you have to sort of punch to get through. Yeah. See, just need to figure out. Is, yeah. And folks, this is why we always say, don't try to sell an idea because everybody has ideas. That's, yeah. you know, you, you have to have the actual stuff behind it. Yeah. Um, all right. So how much time should be spent on contacting traditional press versus social? And are traditional press outlets dead? This person's trying to get me into trouble. Because I <laughs> But that's that's why we do the show. It's, it's so we all get in trouble together and therefore it's, it <laughs> comes across like an information thing. <laughs> it's like we heard it somewhere. It wasn't just her. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is complicated. Um, oh, I really want to be very honest. <laughs> well, just be honest, and then what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that the people that are listening to this did not see that look on your face right there. So, yeah. Um, but I mean, it had, at the end of the day, it has changed. You know, 15 years ago, yes, you had to go to the traditional press. Now, not so much. Not too much. I mean, that, I, I would say that that is the answer and not just video games. Um, my, my sister works in the film industry. So um, I, I see that happen very often with the films that she works with. And it's, it's across the entertainment sector. And it's because, uh, you know, the things that we have in our phones, you know, social media and all these things are like you were saying earlier, it's just like the attention span of everyone is being reduced so much. And what are people looking at and like learning about things and products and things they want to engage with um, are not the same as they were. And over the past two years, the world radically changed. And I think we cannot ignore that. And the way people, uh, for, I'll just give a very simple example and I'll use myself as a consumer um, uh, persona. Um, I am the kind of person that silenced a lot of news outlets and traditional things like that because it was so overwhelming to be following so many news and it was just making me really sad and tired so i started following people that added value in to my life in various different ways on social media and other different spaces and that's how i sort of got used to engaging with the world right now um on my social media platforms and this is me being a consumer so there's Millions of people out there that have changed radically how they engage with news or press. And um, the world has changed a lot. And that, 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 me that means that there is um, some shakeups um, in all industries across the globe. Um, and the video game in industry is no um, 
it's not it's not very it's not excluded from these changes and and the interesting thing about this this industry which i am enjoying so much working in is that things change so fast you're in like in a constant i i call i was i was telling around that i feel like i've done like three mbas lately because like you're just learning so much stuff all the time and you have to like master things so often and so this industry is the fastest that i've seen um, and if you add up that the world has changed a lot in the past two years, then I would say like anything that sounds very traditional to you or to the person trying to come up with something new with a very unfamiliar, unknown product, it's a small in in the uh, studio or game. Um, if you think outside the box, you might find things that are more connected to the goals that you have. So the next question coming up is about social media channels that you prefer. And I want to share a little nugget right before we get into that. And this is courtesy of myself and another Gen Xer. We were looking this morning at how to properly dice up these videos that we do for social media. And it's like, how long should it be? And, you know, she and I were both like, you know, a minute to three minutes, maybe a minute to two minutes. So in the meantime, I Googled ideal length for a YouTube show, an Instagram reel, and a TikTok video. Ideal one, a YouTube short max is 60 seconds. Ideal duration is between 15 and 60 seconds. Ideal length for an Instagram reel is, what is the, the three to 15 seconds long. And TikTok is 21 to 34 seconds. So that's how our attention span has has shortened and how long you have to catch somebody's eye. So when you're looking at those trailers, if y'all put seven seconds of a zoom in on the logo of the studio and the game, you've already, you're shit out of luck. You already lost people. Um, so with all that, so Jack Soder asked, which social media sites do you prefer for video game marketing? I would answer that with another question, which I hate when people do it to me, but like which social media sites do your audience, your potential gamers prefer to find out about games? And that's going to base on the demographics of your audience. If it's younger, it's going to be Instagram and TikTok. If you're going for that older 35, 40 year old plus market, it's probably going to be Facebook. <laughs> Uh, the interesting thing I, I've learned about Instagram lately, Instagram has been, you know, modifying a lot of the algorithm to promote. If, if, if you're doing reels, the algorithm picks you up more as a content creator than any other um, of the tools that they have. And one of the things that used to work really well with Instagram's algorithm was a carousel format. So you just do like a slide deck on the fixed post formats. And that was really, 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 really good. 2020, 2021, this year, they're changing the algorithm. So right now, it's really hard to pick up what's going on with Instagram, um, whereas TikTok has it very sorted out. So it, so it, 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 there's been a very interesting demographic change when it comes to Instagram versus TikTok. So now it's even like Instagram is for elder millennials. And then now TikTok is for anyone that is basically not old. <laughs> I don't even know what Gen X falls in there then. So I'm not sure. Oh, I love elder millennials. That's a, that's a new demographic right there. I know. So Gwen ask any tips on increasing your social media conversion rate? Good content. And good content doesn't doesn't necessarily always mean perfect graphics or perfect images. Just sit for 15 minutes and check out all the different TikToks and you'll see that people are not very crafty with how the videos look. They don't have to be perfect, but they have to be entertaining and they have to be funny or capturing or you have to be telling a story. It's interesting that the length format of TikTok used to be like the attention span used to be like nine seconds and now it's up to 21. Because one of the formats that is working very well with TikTok is story time. We're telling stories. Um, so you can even just record yourself and start talking about your video. And that's going to pick up the algorithm a little bit more than if you create a perfect little video that it only lasts six seconds. I know it doesn't sound logical, but people want to engage with good stories. 
So, so I know instead of doing a social media post, you do a social media post talking about how you're going to do a social media post and that gets picked up. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. I know, but, but obviously it has to be about how you tell it, right? So you're not going to be like, okay, guys, I'm just going to do a social media post today. You're going to be like, hey, so I'm going to start creating a campaign for my game. And this is the first time I'm doing it. So I was thinking about posting something. And this is sort of more or less the videos that I'm thinking about. And you upload that video and that's going to get picked up. Huh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's about good content. You know, it's about telling a story. Like if you're posting a screenshot, why are you posting a screenshot of the game? Like, y are you doing it or like, oh, here's the new, here's new content or here's a new world or here's a new palette of colors, or this is a new character, like then introduce or talk a little bit more about it. Then that's good content, not just a screenshot. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, all right. So one, just we're already over an hour here. What's your time look like, Marcella? Do you have time for a few more or? Yes, let's do a little more. Okay. Cue them up, Dan. Would you fund a game where the develop where the dev have a publisher that would provide everything except in advance for the development budget? If not, why would you avoid that kind of deal? Well, that is more like a joystick venture question. Like, you know, Ivan would definitely be able to answer that. Um, we have invested with in games that already have a publisher and we can only invest in development budgets, of course. Um, we would just have to look at the deal structure of it. But yeah, anything. So when, yeah. The easiest way to find out is you just submit it on their contact us page and <laughs> Worst case scenario, Marcella drinks her non-caffeinated oat <laughs> juice coffee and says no, and we go from there. All right, what's up? What's up next, Dan? For live marketing, how much of an impact would a Twitch stream of development or a developer notes meeting or asset creation of the game have? Hang on, I need to read that. Uh, would a Twitch stream of development dev notes meeting? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I mean, it like I, I always say, it's better to be out there and trying things and like testing and engaging with people than not doing it. Um, so I guess you just have to sort of try it. Um, yeah, I, I, oh. I, I don't know. It, it's, it's, a, it's very specific. So I would have to look into what you're looking at trying to do, but um I, I always think that trying to get out there and talk more about your game and showing things always going to do better than not doing it. So here's my take. I think this is going to go, depending on what you're actually showcasing, what you may end up be, what you may end up doing is marketing more to that technical and artist side. Because personally, mm. I've been in games for 25 years watching the people on Twitch that are coding. I know that is fascinating to some people. It, uh, I would rather watch paint dry. It, it's just, I, it's not my thing. So you have to understand what does your consumer want to see? And my guess is that it would be less of the actual coding brainstorming sessions for ideas, features, you know, plot points that that could be actually Mm. more universal than mm. sitting and doing a lot of the more mundane aspects that a lot of us go through every day. No one is going to want to sit and watch me go through a spreadsheet and see which publishers <laughs> need to see which demo that's coming in. They may be interested in sitting in on our pitch meetings where we're going through these decks and going, that's good. That's not whatever, but it comes down to your, comes down to your audience. And if you make it too technical, you're going to lose mass market. That, that, I, I, I love that you talked a little bit, uh, uh, that you talked about it. And just to add, add on it, I've seen instances in which studios have focused a lot their communications on like, oh, this is how we're creating a game and things like that. But then you end up with a very narrow um, audience that it's technical people that are interested in this type of thing. And it, it, it excludes people that do not understand about that in, right. with engaging. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I have no idea if your code looks good or not. It all looks like Greek to me. It took me multiple hours to get Game Pass running on my 
Steam Deck the other day. So, and all I had to do was type in one line of Linux code for that. Um, Dan's going <laughs> to Twitter series first post is a video about me talking about how I'm going to make a video about making a video about talking about making a Twitter post about something. And then post two is going to be video talking to, about me making a video talking about this post that I'm going to make. And yeah, and then the video <laughs> talking about making a post. See, but what you have built there, Dan, is a content calendar. And that's what you're <laughs> doing. There is, there is a content calendar. And he's already talking about it. And this is already content. <laughs> like, Shark, this is part five. As you change your mind, you want to go back and do it again. All right. So we've got one or two more questions left. And Marcella is on our Discord server. So if you have questions, we've always got, you know, space for there to ask mm -hmm. as well. Um, if you lean more Android, how important is it to localize beyond English? What markets would you focus on? That is a very good question. Oh, yes. Uh, it depends on the genre. I hate when people answer like this, like, oh, it depends on the game. Oh, that's but like the theme of the show is it <laughs> depends. That's the, it, yes. It's the, it, it, it depends. So it depends on the genre and it, it, Oh my God, it's so fascinating for me to be uh, a Joystick Ventures and have a, a very different portfolio because we can even see what types of um, genres and things appeal to certain markets. And, and it's fascinating to watch it on real time. I'm sorry to talk about myself instead of like answering the question. But, but that is answering the question. It's so fascinating because you can see one game, and I, I can't talk about the games that I'm thinking in my head right now, but one game that is just picked up really big in a market that it was so unexpected for us. And it's just so incredible. And one of the things that has helped a lot, one game that I can talk about uh, that is already out uh, that we've invested in, it's called Lost in Play. It's a point and click adventure, beautiful animations. You're going to play a cartoon. Um, Lost in Play does not have a lot of words in the game, and it's gibberish. You know, it's just brr, 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 the, the little um, characters talk and it's just fun to listen to them because anyone can understand them. Although one person did ask what language they were talking about and I was like, no, it's just gibberish. Uh, yeah, but, hold but, on to that link, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so basically that um, helped localize the game to, you know, the controls and stuff to every language possible that we can, that we could. And this is where we got a lot of surprises from different markets that we were not expecting because this game was available in regions that normally don't get games that can understand. Um, so I always do suggest to do more research on that. I cannot share the knowledge that I have because it's not public. But I don't know, Jay, maybe you might have some more public knowledge to share. So this is the beautiful thing about when you start talking about localization and how a lot of countries don't get the credit that they deserve depend again depending on not only the genre but you know we're saying android so we know the platform but also the business model the look at places like india look at places like the middle east where there Brazil. are gigantic populations of people who one don't get marketed to as much as somebody in the us or canada or germany but two i just posted a link in twitter to a thread that mike rose from ravendale did yesterday and he's talking about how People who were spoofing their, you are spoofing their, what are those things called? IPs to appear to be from Argentina were buying their game for like $2 versus 30 or 40 or whatever, which is shitty, but you know, it happens. But he talks about how the growth in Argentina, even from people who aren't actually in Argentina, boosted them straight up the charts on the Nintendo eShop threat. And it's fascinating because it's... you do little things like this. People don't think about it. And the reason is because Nintendo counts all of the Americas, North America, South America, Latin America as one market. And so if something is blowing up in units sold because they don't look at revenue, 
it can be blowing up in one of these countries where it's not that expensive. And exactly. Brazil. it boosts your sales in the US where that shit is expensive. So yeah. I would say I would say Brazil is a very underestimated market in this industry. It is. It's it's a continent in itself, the size and the amount of people that have access to um, mobile and a switch is impressive. Um, and PC. So think about that. And on, also, there's there's a there's a way that you can test this out um, that it's a little bit leaner than actually going into localizing the entire game, which is localize your Steam page to a couple of different languages and see if that picks up. You know. And if you don't know the languages, you know, if you read really carefully, try Google Translate and people, when they they see that you're doing an effort in your sm a, a smaller studio, they might even help you if there's some things wrong with your translations and, and they, they might give you a hand. So that's a like really low budget way of testing out different markets. Test and experiment. Yeah, exactly. All right. So Marcella, Thank you. So was that was that all that some of our questions, Dan? Yeah. Well, awesome. How's so, that? I mean, there was there was there was some more, but if you want to, you can come into Discord and answer them. See, there we go. Thank you we'll, we'll so you. much. You everybody for the last two weeks of joystick has made these shows go by so fast. Yes. It is <laughs> ridiculously fun. So thank you. Uh hopefully. I will see you in a couple of weeks in Mexicali, the hottest place in the world, apparently. <laughs> um, and that's going to be fun right before I go to Sweden. The Our new next conference is coming up December 6th and 7th. Uh, tickets are already on sale, but y'all know it's, it's free unless you want to use the meeting system. It's 50 bucks if you want to do that. And if you can't afford it, if you're from one of these places in the world or y'all are just getting started or whatever, and you're like, look, I got to pitch my game, but I don't have 50 bucks, DM me, email me, I'll hook you up. Mm -hmm. That's why we do this sort of stuff. So if anything parting that you would like to plug, Marcella? No, this was so much fun. I didn't even realize that the, like more than an hour has to go by. So. Well, you're always welcome to come back. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, we can do this later. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being on. Yay. Already, Dan. It's my turn. All right. Your turn. Thank you all so much for watching Indie Game Business. And thank you, Marcella. See this right here? Tripwire Presents. That's our sponsor. Thank you so much, Tripwire Presents, for sponsoring us. If you are not in our Discord right now, you must be there. Discord.gg slash Indie Game Business. Honestly, if you just like type in indie game business as one word into Google, that will bring you everywhere for all of our stuff. Oh, I have no volume. I'm I have no volume in Discord. That's okay. They're already in our Discord. They're already they're in there. our Discord. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about you. I was talking about you anyway. So that's why I was muted. I didn't want y'all in Discord to know what that is. Also, so we have this is on YouTube. It's on Twitch. If you're not watching on Twitch, twitch.tv slash indie game business. And podcasts everywhere this is going to be a podcast really soon i'm going to break it into two pieces i also have the last week's to post as well but i was at twitchcon so <laughs> i'm gonna give me some slack come on there's other podcasts that have been going up though from the last convention but thank you so much we're really excited and thank you marcella thanks jay have a have a blessed day everyone see y'all next week thank you